All right, you ready for this? Ready. Hey everyone, this is Tom Salami. Welcome back to Device Talks Weekly. As always, I'm here with my partner in crime, Chris Newmarker. Chris, how's it going over there? Hey, so far so good. Your, your co-workers are having a good time. I can hear them in the background. Uh, they're office mates. Oh, yeah. That would, be, uh, uh, that would be my children. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're all they sheltering, were sheltering in place now. That's, uh, or, or actually, like, the, the real serious shelter in place actually starts tomorrow in Minnesota. But they, There's good news. I'm, I'm going to boost the economy. I'm buying a house. So that should, like, that should set the market straight. A good vote of confidence uh, in the economy and in the state of our country. You should get a medal, Tom. Of course, I made the offer about three weeks ago, but uh, you know what? Going forward with it anyway. Hey, America. Of course, the first house I bought was in the summer of 2001, so that didn't work out so well. Uh, and then the next one was 2006, so a couple of years later, we had a little trouble, but I'm thinking now, I'm thinking now. Hey, so next time you, you're getting ready to buy the house, let me know, and I'll uh, I'll, I'll, sell my, I'll sell some of my stocks, you know, it'll be good. <laughs> I'll give you a heads up, but enough about me and my and my questionable real estate doings. Uh, let's talk about uh, the matter yes. at hand, which is, of course, all that's going on with COVID nineteen. And this week, we're uh, really f- sort of focusing on the intersection between med tech and the government, and how the government is responding to yes. uh, to this crisis. So today, I talked with uh, Tracy Eberly of Fang Consulting about. Well, we, we're going to talk about the FDA. But as we'll hear in the interview, uh, the topic that came up and probably was even more interesting was MDR. So we had some news on the MDR front this week. Uh, We had an article on Wednesday in MDO, our our publication. But uh, are you hearing anything from the industry in terms of uh, the the possibility of perhaps even likelihood of a a delay in implementing uh, MDR? I mean, the big news is now the um, European Commission is asking the uh, European Parliament to uh, you know to, to institute a um, you know a one year delay and for uh, you know people outside the industry might not know this but you know anytime I talk to you know insiders at the big medical device companies I mean the MDR has just been a huge issue for them and frankly you know you see any of the surveys anything really about this I mean a lot of them have really actually struggled to meet the deadlines I and mean, this was a major tightening of Europe's uh, regulation of medical devices, and uh, and and now it looks like uh, the industry will have a, a little more time. It's uh, you know, I guess that that's good news for the companies trying to you know reach that deadline. Um, the bad news is that it, you know it took a horrible pandemic for it to happen. So here we are. But I mean, it could. I mean, it definitely like you know something that could like ease some stress for medical device companies as they try to deal with all the the disruption you know that, that's going on around this uh, around this virus well tracy everly welcome to the podcast thank you so this has certainly been an interesting month uh, overall globally and the medical device in particular the medical device industry in particular has been uh, sort of at the forefront of everything and one area where uh looks like we're, we're seeing some significant changes that could i guess benefit the device industry is uh is regulatory i want to talk about the fda as why we were going to talk initially uh but uh the big news this week is is probably uh, mdr in fact we're recording this on wednesday just for clarity so uh we just got the news that uh there might be a uh, delay in the mdr deadline what does this mean for your uh, your device clients this is a major change in strategy for our device clients. Uh, many were working very hard to uh, get their MDD recertified before the MDR came in. Uh, that window had mostly closed with most notified bodies. That window will now reopen, so they will be able to get new MDD certificates that could last four years. They also will be able to get MDD changes in. Uh, so that was one of the issues. If you had MDD cert, but you had a significant change, you were going to have to upgrade the MDR anyway. And then you will not have to be compliant with MDR for another year. Uh, so um, if you are MDR compliant, that's fine. Uh, good for you. But if you are not, you have another year to prepare your technical files and design dossiers for MDR compliance. 
And what do you think the impact will be on device companies with that news? Is it uh, where, where were people in their preparation? I mean, clearly we're all struggling to sort of keep pace. So I'm sure it's a great relief, but how are folks doing in getting ready for uh, the MDR deadline? It's all over the map. Uh, the large multi-billion dollar corporations have been on this for years. Um, they've seen it coming and have been doing millions and millions of dollars worth of work. Mid-sized and smaller companies have been a variety of um, pretending nothing's happening to we'll deal with it when we have to. Uh, so I have some mid-sized and small clients that are overjoyed. I have some very large clients that, while they're happy, are a little now looking at the money they spent to try and get this done and wondering if they you know, could have saved a little money or the competitive advantage they thought it might, they might have gotten over a competitor that didn't get MDR is going to evaporate. Uh, so it's going to be a real mixed bag for our larger clients who spent the time and money to get prepared. And it's really going to be great for the mid and small size companies that have been avoiding dealing with MDR. So what is next then in, in regards to MDR? Those who have that extra year, uh, should they, uh, they probably shouldn't wait too long to get started on it. They don't want to find themselves in the same situation. What, what advice are you giving? Correct. They still need to work on it. Uh, the biggest thing, the number one thing, is get your post-market data in now. You're going to need it. Uh, many, many people have been um, surprised at how much additional post-market data is required for their clinical evaluation reports. Uh, these devices have been on market for years, uh, and this data should exist. You now have another year to gather this data, and this is going to help you immensely when you do submit for MDR because you will have the post-market data that MDR requires. Good advice. How about here on uh, in the U.S.? Uh, what sort of changes, if any, have you seen from the FDA? They must be operating differently like, uh, like everybody else, but uh, is it slowing uh, reviews at all? It's too early to tell if COV-19 is going to slow reviews. Uh, FDA has had some changes on the amount of time you can get back to them, and they are doing um, distance meetings instead of having you fly to Rockville for your meetings. Um, but <clears throat> we haven't seen any slow up in 510K approvals or PMA approvals, PMA supplements. Uh, I think that will actually show up a few months down the line if it does show up. Uh, it just depends on um, whether they, they close the FDA in, in uh, Maryland or if they stay open and continue to work through through the whole crisis. Have you been uh, sitting in on any of these teleconferences, and how effective are they? I have not been sitting in on any teleconferences. I'm just trying to keep up on mainly MDR. That has been a humongous issue for our clients, uh, so that is my number one focus. Uh, the FDA changes uh, with the submission times and, and meetings is interesting, but uh, hardly earth-shattering. Um, they should have been doing conferences for a long time ago instead of making everybody fly there. Um, so, so I was wondering. Yeah, exactly. Trust me, there's a lot of people that are like, finally, and can we not go back to making us fly to Washington just to present for an hour? So, um, but I don't think I don't think we're seeing major changes in the U.S. Immediately, if we see anything, it'll be after the crisis, and then when we can go back and look what what worked and what didn't work, we might see some changes. But this is an organization that doesn't change fast. They're they're very slow and deliberate. Uh, so if we see changes, I wouldn't I would expect to see them a year or two from now, if then. And what about EUAs, emergency use authorizations? I bet you're seeing a lot of those. Yes, there is a, a ton of interest in that right now. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the drug companies just submitted, oh, I can't remember the name, but they just submitted an application for a drug that would give them patent protection for like seven or ten years longer than it should, and there's a lot of a lot of discussion about whether they should, should get that approval or not. But yes, the emergency use applications are probably through the roof right now, uh, and uh, will continue to be so for the next three months to six months probably. And, and when should companies consider filing for those? What are, what are the uh, conditions that you need to meet to uh, qualify for one? I haven't found one lately, so I can't list all their criteria, but I can tell you that we meet all of them right now. <laughs> so uh, there's really not going to be a lot of discussion if your application is in any way related to treating uh, coronavirus patients. And, of course, respirators, blood oxygen, uh, per personal protective equipment, a variety of things are, are very much affected by this. And if you are able to add an additional stream into the you know, current stream of devices, uh, your application is going to be looked on quite favorably and probably approved quite quickly. Great. And just final question, any changes to normal 510K or PMA routes uh, as a result of the coronavirus? 
Not that we know of right now. Those those are pretty baked in, and I don't see any major changes other than um, you're probably going to have a little more time to get back with your second and first and second round of questions. Uh, they're not going to be pushing you as quickly. Uh, everybody is realizing that uh, the response times are going to be slower throughout this pro- process. So. Okay, great. Well, great. Thanks, Tracy, for taking the time to uh, update us on everything. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. All right. Thank you very much. I also talked with Joy Sturm of law firm Hogan Lovells about the DPA. You and I talked about the Defense Production Act in their first podcast, and there's still a lot of question marks as to what it means for the medtech industry and, and how it should be implemented. Well, Joy Sturm, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. Nice to be here. Well, let's talk about the, the news of the week, the uh, Defense Production Act. What does the, the, the DPA actually allow the government to do? A, a whole bunch of things, but to boil it down to its essence, it allows the government to act and prioritize its needs in a case where it's invoked. And typically that's in time of a disaster, wartime. Here we are now in the time of a pandemic where there's um, a national emergency having been you know, declared by the president and a health emergency being having been declared by the Department of Health and Human Services. It's, it's really extraordinary authority that is invoked in these extraordinary types of time. The statute was uh, enacted during the Korean War and dealing with that situation. So it's been around for quite some time. But I, I would say in terms of the key extraordinary um, powers that it affords the government in terms of buying and procuring, It allows the government um, the authority to issue what is called a rated order. And that is an order either placed against an existing government contract or just pushed out to a company that doesn't even have a contract. And it basically requires the recipient company to prioritize the order from the federal government and push the other work that they are currently, you know, working on to a lower rung. So, so really it, what it means is the federal government comes first. And typically the, the rated orders will have, you know, specific volume and a timeline requirement. And there are ways to, you know, for companies to communicate with the federal government and say that they need more time or they just can't meet the order. And so there are ways to kind of work around the rated order. But in general, it the government has an expectation and a demand that the order is going to be met and that they're going to be prioritized. Okay. So there's no there's no nationalization of, of a company. The, the government isn't coming and taking over. They're merely placing an order and basically cutting a line and saying, you're, you're serving us first before you get to anyone else. You got it. But so that's one key authority under the the DPA, the Defense Production Act. Another one is this allocation authority where the government can basically go to suppliers and require that they use their supply and manufacturing line capacity in a way that is needed to meet whatever, you know, federal need is is determined. And so that means potentially taking a, you know, going to a device manufacturer and and asking them to divert production from, you know, the manufacturer of a, a suite of device products to just focus on one that is of urgent need to the, you know, to the citizenry, right? Or Or they can go to companies that don't currently manufacture anything even, you know, remotely close to what is needed, but they have a good manufacturing capacity and say completely divert your line to manufacturing what the government needs. You can also ask companies to um, save capacity for when it's needed or to reduce capacity or reduce current production to so that it's of capacity is available when it's needed and that sort of thing. So that's that's the allocation authority. Mm-hmm. Does the government have the ability to, uh, I was listening to Governor Cuomo's press conference yesterday and he was talking about the capital that could be provi- provided to, say, an automobile company and that has a factory that could be retrofitted to to create, to develop ventilators or some other medical device. 
Is there a, a, a funding mechanism to the DPA that would benefit those companies or any company that was sort of being directed to create a certain product? Yes, there is a funding component, absolutely. And that is, you know, part of it. The government can, under the under Title III, they can, you know, give loans, loan guarantees, purchase commitments. There's, there's a lot of authority there for, in terms of just the financial support to be provided to companies to make these, you know, retrofitting and expansions. Absolutely. There is there is very uh, broad authority in in that way. And, and you know, we, I can say just from my practice, what I'm seeing just in the last week or so is that, you know, certainly the DPA is out there as a tool that the federal government can use. We are also just seeing within industry a good deal of discussion around what can be done just even even before the DPA order comes right, to, to use additional capacity or to, you know, try to meet the, the obvious needs for ventilators, for masks, for surgical gowns, to, uh, you know, find, in, you know, locations where potentially testing could be done, you know, all, all kinds of things. But absolutely, the DPA gives the government authority to go to industry and instruct them to do what what the government wants them to. Now, is there a sense that that sort of direction is needed? If you the med tech industry uh, would suggest that they're they are doubling down, tripling down if they have to to get to to build as many ventilators or whatever products they need at the moment without any sort of direction from the government. Where would is DPA involvement or inaction? Where would that speed the process or or help the industry? create more ventilators or respirators or whatever else is necessary? You know, that's a really good question. And it's something that I think we've all been talking about. You know, I, I think that within industry, there is a great desire to try to meet the, you know, the urgent needs. And, you know, it, it, these are businesses, but uh, these are businesses within the life sciences space and their missions really are to to support health. They want to do it, but the sense is that w- while there is all kinds of really really positive intent to try to do whatever can be done to meet the need, there really needs to be a focus, a, a degree of leadership from the government to identify exactly what the needs are. And, and then in a measured and efficient way to sort of dole them out, if you will. And, and that comes from, you know, starting grassroots from local, right, local, municipal, to state, to federal. Um, there, uh, you know, industry needs to get its signals from these, you know, government and centralized agencies and entities so that they they know where to focus. I, I the sense that we get is that with all the good intention, you know, there there just needs to be focused leadership and identification of specific need and and doling it out. So the the, the specific direction has to come from the federal level, though. Correct. I mean, that's, the states can ask for it, say we need more ventilators. We've got an increasing number of cases, but the actual order has to come from a federal entity. Well, if if the Defense Production Act is being invoked, that has to come from the federal government, absolutely. I'm not suggesting that, you know, identification of, of the need it needs to be done by the federal government sort of um, in a vacuum, by, by no um, You know, I, I, it's certainly a cooperative effort between all of the states and localities identifying what they are projecting as the need and then just communication between among and with the federal government to make sure that the needs are coordinated and met to the greatest extent possible. Nothing is is going to be perfect, but to try to coordinate. And I know, I mean, I think we all understand that efforts are underway by the federal government, but I, I think there is a good deal of sort of questioning like where where is it, you know, what is the exact definition of, you know, the path forward and who's being called on for what? What is what is the need in each category? 
And is there a an agency or an office in the federal government that would be the the entity that would issue these orders ultimately? That's a very good question. So the Department of Health and Human Services was tasked by the president to take the lead on invoking these orders under the Defense Production Act. And again, that's that's just under the this emergency procurement authority. Of course, other entities and agencies can order outside of this authority, with no question. But the agency that takes the lead with respect to this emergency tool is the Department of Health and Human Services, and then they have the ability to delegate that authority to other agencies within their department and also with outside. So, for example, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Defense, right? Those agencies can absolutely um, take the lead on part of the procurement. Another one is the General Services Administration that, you know, already, you know, been delegated authority to, to take the lead on some of this procurement as well, not for medical so much as for related like telecom and IT. And just the final question, I guess, I'm wondering where we go from here. Is, it, is the med tech industry, does it merely wait for in order to come? Are companies making themselves known to the federal government that we are here, we're, we're, oh, we're, we've got your place in front of the line here for you to come and place an order? Where, where are we? And, and I guess, where do you, do you see this, this going? Do you see anything coming from it? So I think companies at this point are trying to figure out what their capacity is, and especially for the key items like masks and PPE, ventilators and ventilator components and such. I think at this time, it, you know, it's really the time to figure out what, what can they make, uh, what do they make that might be needed in this pandemic situation. And to the extent that they are diverting or, you know, aligning capacity with a new or considering aligning it with a new, you know, type of product manufacturer interfacing with the government and in particular the FDA, HHS, to figure out whether there's additional, you know, approval, um, you know, registration, whatever, or not just to confirm that they are acting in a way that's consistent with the federal requirements, that whatever they do, they're going to be protected as much as possible by whatever immunities are out there against potential liability for acting quickly in this emergency situation and and just moving ahead and, and also being very much cognizant of the fact that the federal government likely will be coming under the the DPA with orders and just being sort of nimble and ready and and able and understanding. I mean, part of it's also just understanding what their rights are and responsibilities in light of this new procurement authority and the emergency tools that are out there. And that's where, you know, sort of watching and and, um, also consulting with counsel and and experts makes, makes a difference as well. Well, Joy Stern, thank you so much for this information and for uh, this conversation. It's been very, very helpful. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Are you seeing any results of the invocation of of the DPA out there in MedTech land? Well, I mean, it was it was kind of interesting. Uh, Trump last week said, "I'm invoking it. I'm sending something to set up." the, you know, the the potential to use it. But then, you know, pretty quickly after that, you know, there was a lot of clarification from the White House that they really didn't plan to use it that much. Um, That, and, you know, and in fact, over the weekend in one of his briefings, Trump said that, uh, that, you know, he, um, I think his exact, uh, you know, words were that, you know, we, we have the threat of doing it if we need it. We may have to use it along the supply chain in a minor way, but he was saying, hey, we have a lot of things happening right now. Companies are stepping up and doing all this stuff. You know, 3M's going to you know, make us hundreds of millions of you know, face masks and all, all kinds of stuff. Um, but, you know, it, it's turning into a real debate because on the other side, you've got, you know, somebody like Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, who, you know, is pretty much like every day pleading with the, uh, you know, with the with the uh, Trump administration to, to invoke that act to, uh, you know, to kind of like, you know, get, you know, it's basically like, you know, getting the, the government, like getting the, um, the orders for those ventilators and face masks and everything on the front of the line with all those manufacturers and, you know, getting those things made and then, 
you know, ha- getting them distributed in kind of like a more centralized way, getting them to the places that need it right now. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, Cuomo, definitely New York is facing now really like the largest outbreak in the in the country. And it looks like they're they're heading into that first. So he needs he needs a lot of ventilators and he needs a lot of face masks. And he he, he really has been pushing the administration to, to do more with that act because he says, I need these things, you know, cause they're, they're heading in. So. Yeah. And that's the question as to whether the med tech industry, I think many will tell you we are responding. We, we are seeing, uh, um, statements being put out by companies like Philips and ResMed talking about, uh, doubling or hopefully tripling their production. ResMed, Mick Farrell put out a, a statement about that, that they're hoping they have doubled and are hoping to triple global production of ventilators and non-invasive ventilators and other life-saving equipment. So one could argue yeah. that you don't need the DPA, but it sounds as if a, uh, a quarterback would be a, a, an important part of this uh, pandemic fighting team. And, and they get a sense that the quarterback might not be uh, on the field at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And it was interesting um, to this week that uh, Scott Whitaker, the uh, the head of Avamed, you know, Avamed is the trade group for the medical device industry. He sent a letter to to FEMA saying, you know, could we please you know, basically could we please have more, you know, centralized managing of where ventilators are going? I mean, the device companies will meet the demand. We'll do everything we can. We'll even, you know, help, you know, with training in hospitals. But we need you know, I mean, every state in the country wants, wants ventilators. I mean, this is what you're going to need to keep people alive who have, you know, serious versions of this virus. And, uh, you know, the, the device industry has every state wanting these. And they're, uh, you know, they're they're asking the federal government, you know, to, you know, hey, tell us what the priorities are. Tell us where the, you know, who who should, you know, get these first, you know, so that we're, you know, you know, making sure that the you know, that the, you know, states that are going into this first are, are getting what they, what they need. And, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's amazing to see a trade group for an industry actually asking the government to do more when it comes to telling them what to do. I mean, but I mean, th- these are the times we live in right now. So, all right. Finally, before we uh, wrap up this episode, I wanted to uh, direct people to Mass Device. Uh, our colleague, Sean Woolley did a uh, really sort of interesting look at, uh, do-it-yourself ventilators. What uh, what does that package look like? Yeah, this is especially uh, this is especially interesting story because obviously, you know, as I said, you know, ventilators are, are in short supply right now, and FDA has actually issued you know guidance around emergency use authorizations. You know, saying hey, you could you know take you know similar approved devices like you know maybe like you know take an anesthesia gas machine and modify it. Um, you know, take positive pressure breathing devices and modify them, use them as ventilators, you know, and we, we've got to, you know, you can apply and get that EUA to, uh, to do that. So that's good. But then you're actually seeing um, some researchers, like, you know, taking another step and really kind of, you know, going full MacGyver here, you know, and like, just like anything they can find trying to, you know, assemble a ventilator. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the University of, uh, of Minnesota had, you know, like, like taking like, I mean, like, taking like, you know, motors from windshield wipers, you know, using them to make ventilators. So, I mean, you're having these DIY ventilators and it isn't just the University of Minnesota. I mean, they've been doing work on this at MIT. You know, there was a hackathon over in Europe. Um, You know, the interesting question is, I mean, one, um, are these really safe? Two, you know, is the FDA, you know, even going to, you know, grant a EUA for something like this? You know, like, um, I mean, there, there, I, there, there is an argument that like, hey, that this is, just kind of too far out to get an EUA, but you know, at the same time, you know, if we have a real shortage, you know, if things get really desperate, you know, if there's if there's a way to you know kind of like put together something that could hopefully maybe work for somebody, um, you know, maybe you know maybe some of this work that we're seeing out of the U of M or uh, or, or MIT, well, we'll see the light of day. So it's a really interesting question, really interesting debate. I know Sean has a request out with FDA for uh, for more comment because we're really interested to hear whether they are you know open to you know granting EUAs around like some of these kind of like DIY style ventilators. So we'll uh, stay tuned. Hopefully, we'll hear from FDA about this. We'll wrap up this episode of Device Talks Weekly. I'd like to remind our listeners that uh, if you go to massdevice.com, we've got a whole tab dedicated to coronavirus live updates. It's there. It's in bright orange. You can't miss it. 
and Chris, your team is doing just a great, great job of uh, staying on top of all the developments. There's just so much. Yeah, going I mean, on. we're we're sometimes posting half a dozen, a dozen stories a day about you know coronavirus in the medical device industry. It's uh, you know it's it's a it's a huge a huge story, a huge story for the industry, a huge story for you know just people in general. Right, and once again, we'd like to uh, remind you to tune in next week for another episode of Device Talks Weekly can find me. I am on LinkedIn. I am on Twitter at MedTechTom and feel free to email me directly. We're getting some emails and it's really, uh, really great to know that you folks are out there. I'm at T Salemi at WTWHmedia.com. So that's T-S-A-L-E-M-I at WTWHmedia.com. And Chris can be found at... See new marker, just like a new marker at WTWHmedia.com. And I'm on Twitter at new marker. And if you want to check out our ongoing coronavirus coverage, go to massdevice.com slash tag slash coronavirus. Fantastic. All right, folks, thanks for joining us this week. Please subscribe. Please share this podcast on your social media channels. And of course, subscribe. So all the future episodes will come directly to your listening device. Right. Take care. Stay healthy. Stay healthy.